Good evening. I'm Sandra Black. I'm a physician uh, and researcher at Sunnybrook Hospital at University of Toronto, and I'm just delighted to be here <clears throat> amongst this distinguished group of speakers and in front of this wonderful audience. Um, I just wanted to start on a personal note because I, um, I come from Sault Ste. Marie. My mother was um, an ardent and tireless community activist, and her contributions were recognized uh, with an Order of Canada in 1985, when she was 68 years old. She continued, she continued to be very active, cross-country skiing, and engaged in many social activities until her 90s, when her memory started to slip, and she eventually died of a stroke. Uh, so I, I, I study stroke and dementia and take care of patients with these problems, but I learned from my mother about caregiving and this is something that's increasingly going to be an issue for all of us because of population aging. How many people in the audience know somebody with dementia or are caring for someone with dementia? Yes. So these are the trends that are in front of us. Now, if I point, can does this? I have to point this way. OK. Um, I'm a clinician. You know, I teach with slides, so <laughs> please put up with me. Uh, but here are some of the important points. So aging. Of all risk factors for the common causes of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and Parkinson's disease, is the most important risk factor. 10,000 baby boomers are reaching 65 years of age every day in the US. And for the first time ever, I think this is really a striking comment in developed countries, adults have more parents than children. Um, you can see the, uh, the trends you know, here in terms of um, 19, 2000 and 2050. So I'm not going to go through all the details of these slides, but just highlight a few things. Uh, it's there for those of you who have time to look at the slides afterwards. Um, and uh, they, they include the, these enormous increases expected in terms of percentage increase in all parts of the world. Europe, 90%. Africa, 300%. Um, going from 44 million people with dementia currently up to 135 estimated uh, by 2050. One person diagnosed with dementia every four seconds, but a lot of people are not diagnosed, so it's even more than we think. An annual cost of 604 billion in uh, 2010, expected to be well over a trillion uh, by 2030. The Canadian landscape is currently about a little over maybe 800,000 or more Canadians living with Alzheimer's-related dementias, um, and that'll be double to 1.4 million, uh, certainly by 2030, that's the estimate. Um, in fact, the, uh, each decade, the percentages go up. So by age 85, which is starting to be the average life expectancy in Canada, 60% will have cognitive impairment. Um, about 25% um, are, are actually demented. Now, what do we mean by dementia? Dementia means that you have cognitive problems that are sufficient to cause, uh, cause you to need help, to be dependent, and need assistance in daily life. Um, and there are 100 causes of dementia, but the commonest ones uh, tend to be um, Alzheimer's and stroke. So let's just look quickly at some of the patterns that we can see now with current clinically available techniques. Uh, first of all, this is what the brain looks like um, at the end of uh, the, uh, the period of um, suffering of Alzheimer's disease compared to a normal brain. And you can see that there's a lot of shrinkage with a little sparing in the sensory motor areas. Plaques are made of amyloid, tangles are made of tau. These are present in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. And the part of the brain that's most affected is the memory area, shown right here. This is called the hippocampus because it looks like a seahorse. That's what you want it to look like. That's what you see in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, other, the new developments that have come, I'll just show you that hippocampus showing this little, let me see, can I go back? So that's little, those two little tiny structures in the brain. That's where you make memories. And when that starts to go, you stop being able to associate information and learn new information. Now we can actually see those tau and amyloid deposits in the brain with something called PET imaging. And you can see different patterns. This is what the tau tangles look like, the red areas. 
whereas the amyloid fills in different parts of the brain. It deposits in the brain uh, as the brain is deteriorating. So with imaging, we can see a lot about um, the different types of dementia, and I'll just point out, besides, Al sorry, besides Alzheimer's disease and healthy aging, here's a loss of tissue in the front part of the temporal lobes, uh, and this is associated with loss of language, understanding of words, and when the right side is affected, loss of the ability to recognize faces and objects. Here you can see that the, the, the front of the brain, sorry, the front of the brain is affected, and here the back of the brain is affected. Uh, that's frontal temporal degeneration. That's an atypical type of Alzheimer's disease. Here you see white matter changes and little black dots. Amyloid actually gets into the blood vessels as well, and it can cause microhemorrhages. And in fact, um, you know, the brain is a vascular network, not just a neural network. Um, and mild and mild, mileage, lots of miles of, uh, of arteries. Um, and vascular damage, just strategically located, shown in this uh, one little spot here in the thalamus, can lead to instant dementia. You lose language, abstract thought, and short-term memory. Here's an example on the CT where there's a blood clot caused by amyloid in the vessels and leads, in this case, led to specific problems with language and vision. But Alzheimer's disease is also a cause of hemorrhage, a cause of stroke. So these are, talk about connections, these are connected pathologies. So, sorry, I almost lasered somebody there. So the, the vascular risk factors mean that we can, we can help prevent cognitive decline if we can control them. And some of these we can't control, like age and genetics, but blood pressure, diet, physical activity, some of those are lifestyle choices that we can make, and we can make a difference to our future brain health, uh, as well as medications and other means to help us control some of those other risk factors. So collaboration must be the new norm across healthcare and our social system. We need teams um, across healthcare, research pillars that are interdisciplinary. We need funding and care agencies to stop being in silos and start to work together to make us all address this enormous challenge. Apart from global warming, plastics in the ocean, all the other things that you've heard that are so depressing and it's going to get worse when you hear the last speaker. So. <laughs> The other thing I learned through my mother's experience is engagement of persons living with dementia and care partners is gonna be essential as we plan the future. I think indigenous people have taught us that uh, very really. And diversity and equity must be part of our thinking. We will have electronic patient records that can chart the patient's journey through the healthcare system. And because we're a single healthcare system, payer healthcare system, we can learn, we can become a continuous quality improvement uh, a project with um, kind of a learning healthcare system if we do it right. We have wearable devices that are going to allow us all to know about ourselves on a daily basis, what our activity levels are, what our vital signs are, or how we slept. Even mood fluctuations can be, um, can be followed and people supported when they're getting in the danger zone of, say, bipolar up and down uh, disorder. Artificial intelligence and machine learning will allow us to um, analyze uh, these incredible data sets and maybe also as a country to begin to contribute internationally because I can tell you we're underfunding research um, in a very significant way compared to other countries. But the Internet of Everything brings all the dangers um, that you will hear about, about security and privacy protection, and so we have to balance privacy with public good. Finally. We do have a, can finally, we do have a Canadian National Dementia Action Plan, the last in most of the developed countries, and it will be focusing on preventing cognitive, and, uh, cognitive decline and, and preserving optimal brain health through various interventions. We do have a national network, research network, where people are synergizing and working together. But we really do have to invest more, I think, in early detection, robust, personalized approach 
to allow us to take advantage of disease-modifying theories. We will be able to treat these diseases, but we have to get them early before people are sick. We have to get people in their pre-symptomatic stage, and that's already happening. By strategic use of biomarkers to identify when the disease is there and it's still silent. Since Alzheimer's and silent or vort stroke are diseases that occur together, in fact, they're the commonest cause of dementia, it's together, optimizing vascular risk factors, lifelong daily exercise, healthy diet should be key societal and personal goals for us all to optimize the chances of, of a healthy aging, aging brain. These are acknowledgments, and I do thank also my institution colleagues and uh, uh, students for all the support I've had over many, many years. Thank you.